Hello and welcome to Fireworks Pyrotechnics. It's a new podcast from the Fireworks Rock and Metal magazine. We're just going to be discussing a few things and see how it goes. And I've got some big hitters with me today. I've got our deputy editor, Dave Cockett, with me. Yeah, right, Dave. Hiya. How are you doing? You all right, Pete? I'm not too bad at all. And we have the main man, the man behind it all, Mr. Bruce Mee. Bye, Bye everybody. Hey, Right then, well, of course, we're going to kick off with our favourite topic. We're going to talk about us for a little bit. When I say us, I don't mean us old chaps here, but I mean us as in the magazine. And I'm going to hand this one over to Bruce, because I want to just ask you a question, Bruce, because obviously I'm I'm the youngest one here in the, in the fact of joining the, the company and helping out. But when you go back all the way, Bruce, to when fireworks started and, you know, all the way back to issue one, if anyone came up to you and said, you know, listen, in... Uh, this year we'll be releasing issue 102 and then 103 to come up. You know, would you have believed them? What would you have said? Has the magazine grown the way you want it to? I never expected the magazine to go beyond a few years. It, you know, it was just something. I am sure Dave will agree. When I was in the 80s, when we had Kerrang! and Raw Magazine, Metal Hammer, those magazines at that period were wonderful. I used to look yeah. forward to buying Kerrang! every week, reading the import section, loved it. And then round about the early 90s, they kind of changed. It didn't bother me that they wanted to include new genres, because you have to grow and expand to survive. But what Kerrang! did, which I really hated, was they started taking the piss out of the old bands, the bands that had made them when they started in 82. So I got really annoyed at that. And of course, I ended up. I stopped buying Kerrang. I stopped buying Metal Hammer because it wasn't the music I was interested in. So that's why I wanted to start doing fireworks. I wanted it to be more like Kerrang was in the 80s or Metal Forces. And to be honest, it was a fanzine when it started, but it covered the music I was interested in, which was melodic rock, no thrash. It was basically just melodic rock back then. But then, as you said, over the years, baby steps we, we've improved it every couple of years we've done something different to improve it we've gone from just color center pages to full color we've increased the number of pages from 60 to 84 to 100 to 132 and now thanks to mr cockett we've been at 164 for like the last four or five issues which i think is perfect so <laughs> did i believe we'd be here 21 years later 23 years later no, not at all. And I never expected we'd have a magazine that was just so professional and so good looking. I'm, I'm biased, of course, but I think it's one of the best magazine, music magazines out there, looking and content-wise. I mean, how do you see it growing? I mean, you said we've got to this stage already. Um, have you got any plans to see it grow anymore? What would you like to see? I, did? I mean, obviously, you're the, the editor, the, the main man who uh, does a lot of the funding and all that malarkey, you know. What would you like to see it do? Well, see, the, we used to, ex well, not us personally, but our exporters, our UK distributors, used to export to America uh, and Canada. But then during COVID, or should I say after COVID, because nobody was buying magazines during COVID, or very few. Um, but then after COVID, the people in America started trying to screw us over in prices for everything. And it became not viable to export it. I mean, we were exporting like a couple of thousand copies, but it, it just wasn't viable. So we, I just stopped that because it was costing us like over a thousand pounds every issue just to export those. So I stopped that. But like this latest issue, number 102, is now in double the amount of double eight Smiths. So that's expanded our, our, our base. So hopefully more people will see it, more people will buy it. We won't know until about a month after one or two goes off sale, which will be uh, end of June, July after the next issue comes out. So, but there's very little. What we've done, especially what Mr. What Dave has done, or helped us do, is to improve the content and number of pages and make it as professional as it is. And that's a big thanks to Dave as well. So I think the team working together has made the magazine what it is, and that's what's going to improve the readership. That's what's going to improve the numbers. I just want people to actually take a chance and read it. 
a lot of well, not a lot of people, but some people online on Facebook when I talk to them, they'll say, "Well, I used to buy fireworks ten years ago, but I stopped buying it." But the magazine ten years ago is nothing compared to what it is now, and I've actually sent some of these people PDFs of recent issues, and they're like, "Oh my god, I didn't realise the magazine was so good now." So that's all. All I want is for people to take a chance and see it and read it and see how good the magazine is. I totally yeah. agree. Yeah, so bringing Dave into the conversation as well, because like Bruce has said, you've had a massive input, Dave. I mean, same question to you in some respects as well. Has it grown the way that you want it to grow? And are you, you know, happy with the way it's going? What would you like to see added in as well? Well, to pick up on what Bruce said, I mean, I, I, I was exactly the same. I mean, Bruce and I are roughly the same age, which is positively ancient. But um, we grew up through the 80s when Kerrang! was the Bible, really. Uh, you bought it every month, then every two weeks, then every week. Um, I probably should have stopped buying it 10 years before I actually did because it got to the stage where it was featuring nothing that was of any interest to me whatsoever. Um, but I eventually did. Uh, and you have to remember, once Kerrang! stopped featuring the type of music that we wanted to, to buy, wanted to listen to, in those pre-internet days, it was very, very difficult to try and get um, any information on bands that you liked, on information on new bands, on information on new um, records or CDs when they first came in. Um, so the, the the fanzines, I mean, like uh, I, I remember um, sort of Boulevard um, and, and one or two others that, or, that sort of tried to fill the gap in the mid-90s. And there were noble efforts, uh, but they were just fanzines. Then I, I started, I suppose... Um, I, I, I started with a magazine called Frontiers, which is the only mention that they're ever going to get, and we won't talk about them anymore. But realistically, I started. I, um, I rang Matt Honey up at um, Hard Rocks one day, um, and we got talking, and he asked me if I wanted to start to contribute, which I did. Started to do album reviews, started to do um, a couple of um, interviews here and there. Got a bit of a taste for it. Uh, then when... Hard Rocks um, sort of petered out just because it, it, it became too much for sort of Matt to uh, manage. He'd got um, four kids. He got a full-time job. Uh, and to try and get a magazine out every month, it just became impossible. And I think it got to the stage where it went online, where Bruce who and uh, Mark Ashton, who were um, now and then at the time, they came to me and said, we, we want to start our own magazine um, because there's, there's a gap here that needs um, filling. So um, I, I've been involved with Fireworks since day one. And as Bruce said, it was very much a fanzine and it was very much dedicated to the AOR melodic rock community at that point in time. Because really, uh, in the, um, the, the, the sort of late 90s, there was very little else dedicated to that term type of scene. Um, I contributed quite a lot, I guess, for the first 30 issues or so. Uh, I've, I've always um, done reviews ever since um, it started, but uh, my, my, my taste for interviews tailed off um, quite dramatically, and work and life kind of took over, as these things generally do. Um, but fortunately, uh, a few years ago, I was in the position where I was able to take redundancy from work, and I'm sort of now semi-retired, uh, so I had a lot more time on my hands, although my other half will probably tell you differently. Um, so, what started me to get more actively involved was, um, it was this, I suppose, really, as Bruce knows, it kind of pissed me off that I did an interview that didn't get used uh, in the magazine. Um, and I thought, I, I, I don't like to ask people to do something, put time and effort into it for, them, for it then to just get cast aside because there isn't space. So Bruce asked me to get um, a little, he wanted to know if I wanted to get a little bit more um, actively involved because Stephen Reid the guy who'd been his deputy for a number of years um, decided he wanted to step down. So I, I, I said, yes, I said I, I said I would give it a go. Um, but I did explain that um, I, I'm no shrinking violent, as you've probably um, guessed by now, uh, and that I wasn't just going to sit behind the scenes and proofread everything. Uh, if I was going to get involved, I was going to get involved, which Bruce seemed to be okay with. And it's kind of mushroomed from there. We We... Started to, uh, we, we'd had a couple of issues, I think, that were 164 pages. And when we went from bi monthly to quarterly, uh, which is another story entirely, it, it seemed to be the right thing to do because you're only talking roughly then, you're talking 50 odd pages per month. 
uh, which isn't an awful lot when you think about the number of releases that come out. You think about the new um, all, all the bands that are uh, available for interview. So 164 pages seems to be the right size for the issue. So we determined on that. Uh, and what we've what we've sort of tried to do since then is we're, we're trying to push the envelope a little bit. Now, to be fair, it's gone beyond the original AOR uh, melodic rock market and, and has done for quite a number of years now. And that's the right thing to do, because with the best will in the world, it, it's a market that sells diddly squat. It has fewer and fewer people um, that are actually interested in it, despite Newer bands such as Heat and Eclipse and all those um, sort of people coming along, even the likes of Nesta more recently, it's still a relatively limited market. So to reach um, a bigger audience and to actually get to the stage where the magazine could pay for itself and therefore continue forward, uh, we needed to expand. So now we're covering more blues rock. We're covering uh, more progressive stuff. We're covering more um, metal, power metal, symphonic metal, progressive metal, even the occasional thrash thing from uh, which um, I know um, Bruce is not particularly a fan of. Um, but I and I think that that's the right thing to do. I think that if we can still retain some of the core melodic stuff to keep that audience, that we can not only can we perhaps interest in that interest. That, sorry interest that audience in something um a little bit um, different uh, be it some of the more modern uh, rock stuff that mike nudex a big fan of or um some of the sort of more the, the sort of melodic metal type stuff uh which a lot of the the the, the more melodic bands are veering towards these days uh, then all the better plus fans at the other end of the spectrum that come in because we feature um some of the more extreme bands then might find something further down that they like so it, it's a win-win situation for me um but we do seem as bruce said we do seem to be getting to the stage now where we're getting much more efficient at putting magazines together we're aiming for no wastage um and then to cap things even further this last year or so as you know pete we've um, really started to expand our social media presence uh which again is all geared towards raising the profile of the magazine getting more people to buy the magazine, be it either um, online, uh, in the shop, or even an electronic version, uh, the more the merrier. Indeed. And, you know, hence the reason, obviously, why we're also doing all these uh, new other things online, such as fireworks, unboxed, sound of fireworks, and obviously this as well. I mean, it's uh, it's a good time, like I say. It's a time where the magazine is hopefully expanding and people will, you know, um, take to it and we'll get some more online sales, we'll get some more physical sales. And hopefully we can push back and, you know, get to various other places as well where we haven't been. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, one of the things that, again, so what, one of the things we want to do on here is obviously as well talk about current things that are happening in the music world. And um, one of the things that's grabbed my attention, so we're going to shift focus away now from fireworks, we go to this new uh, topic. And one of them, I know uh, Dave's going to take the lead on this one, uh, because it's the, the weird saga involving Motley Crue and what was well, now ex-guitarist Mick Mars, and the latest news now he's going to he's suing them. He said that obviously that there's uh, how can we put this diplomatically problems using backing track and fake live performances. I believe is a quote that's being used. I mean, obviously Motley Crue have hit back and said that they hope Mick gets the uh, the care that he needs. Which <laughs> don't know how that one's going to go down well. But what's going on with Motley Crue, Dave? They seem to be imploding a bit here. I think they imploded years ago, to be honest with you. I mean, let, let, let's be absolutely honest. First, first and foremost, I'm not the world's biggest Motley Crue fan. I think that the contribution that they've made to the um, the rock and metal scene is, let's say, arbitrary at best. Uh, hasn't really meant anything or driven anything forward for more than 40 years since the first couple of albums. Uh, after that, they became more commercial, just like everybody else and wanted to be a sort of edgy Bon Jovi. The last thing that, to me, that they did that had any real merit was the album they did with John Karabi nearly 30 years ago. Since then, it, it's just been... Musically, on stage uh, and on record, they've been a car wreck. Uh, it, it, th this, to me, smacks of... And firstly, it, 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 it's the whole... It's the way that society seems to be going in every respect these days. Everything has got to be available for everybody to have an opinion on. Everything's got to be done in public. We can't do things behind closed doors privately and settle it like 
gentlemen, we've got to we've got to start shouting and screaming at one another in the press, uh, so that everybody and his mother and um, pet budgie can um, all have an opinion on it. So if that's how they want to play it, which to be fair is what Queen's Rock did ten years ago, is currently what Journey are doing, um, then. They've got to hold their hands up and say, yeah, fair do, if people want to have a pop. So I'll have a pop. Um, as I say, I've not seen Motley Crue for a long, long time, since the 80s. No desire to go and see them again. Um, it pees me off a little bit that bands such as this come back. Um, they've got no new music to promote. They haven't for more than a decade. The last album they released was a car wreck. Uh, in my opinion, um, and they seem to be charging ridiculous prices for people to go out and um, listen to part pre part pre recorded shows. At what point does pre recording backing vocals, pre recording gu guitar parts, pre recording lead vocals, or pre recording anything stop being an actual rock show and start to become a bad karaoke? That's the first thing. Um, then, obviously. Mars decided to make it public that I'm retiring from um, touring or I'm quitting touring. So the band have come along and said, no, you're not. You're just quitting the band. Was he, was he pushed? Did he jump? Does anybody actually really care? Then the writs start flying. The accusations start flying that they've been playing to backing tapes for years. Well, yeah, OK, they may have been playing to backing tapes for years. Lots of bands do these days. Uh, I'm not overly happy with it because I don't think it's authentic and I think it cheats the fans, whoever's doing it. But are they really playing to backing tapes? As I say, I've not seen them. But given some of the footage that we've seen on YouTube and the likes, if they're playing to backing tapes and they're the quality of the backing tapes, the first thing I'd do is sack me bloody sound engineer because they sound awful. And I know that previously the... Um, focus has been on Vince Neil's voice. Now, Vince Neil's voice is shot. He's been shot for 30 years. He's not the only one. Uh, he's not the first, and he certainly won't be the last. But I have to ask myself, it's now got to the stage. Have they realised that the game's up? Are they all sort of now just positioning themselves for um, whatever best share they can get out of an ever-diminishing di pie? Um, are they just the latest example of a band who should have called it quits 30 years ago, sailed off into the sunset with whatever cash that um, they'd gotten, either stuck it in their arm or snorted it up the nose uh, and just left the world to get on with it. Because I, I, I think when you get, and no, no disrespect, disrespect to Def Leppard for um, putting them on the bill with them. Um, uh, Leopard is still a viable band. They can still cut it live. Motley Crue, however, when they go out, to um, potentially boost ticket sales. You're talking ticket sales that's £100 plus. Uh, again, that's a, that's another bugbear and potentially another subject. It pisses me off that you get these big bands from yesteryear that's got nothing new to promote, but all they want to do is put on um, a karaoke performance for an hour, charge people plus 100 quid when people could actually pay 20 quid uh, each for five tickets to see five gigs with five new bands. Uh, but they don't. They'll sooner go and sit in a big drafty um, shed and listen to um, bands like this going through the motions. That really, that really, really gets to me, and that um, that that that's a, that's just indicative of the state of the um, the whole scene today. Is that people would put, rather go and see a tribute? Because let's face it, that's what they are. They're a tribute to what Motley Crue were, and they're a bad tribute at that. Um, rather than actually go uh, and see. Seek out something new. It's almost like comfort eating. Well, I mean, you've raised some strong points there. And I think, uh, you know, if anyone listening, you know, comment down below. Let us know what you think. I mean, obviously, Daisy, you know, um, pointed out some very good um, things there. You know, what are your thoughts on it as well? You know, let us know. Bruce, want to bring you into this as well. I mean, I know that you've sort of read up on it as well. You know, what's your take yeah. on into it, you know, the way oh. you have? First, let me say, like, I saw Motley Crue about 10 years ago when they supported Def Leppard in Manchester. And to be honest, it was a good gig. Vince's vocals weren't that great. But it was an, enjoy an enjoyable gig. And when I've been reading up on it, what people need to realise is why Mick Mars is saying he's stopping touring. Because he's had spondylitis since he was 19. He's got problems with his spine. 
he can't play live. His memory's going a bit as well, but he wants to give up playing live. So he said to the band, I'm not going to play live. And the band said, well, that's okay, but we are part of a, a group. They've got a deal, all four of them, and they, they get 25% each of this. And they're saying, well, if you're leaving, then you're not part of the group any, anymore. But Mars is saying, well, I want 25% of the touring that he's not doing. He's not even going to be in the band when they tour, but he wants 25%. And the band have turned around and said, yeah, but we've got John Five playing guitar. Who's going to pay for him then? You can't get 25% of the tour when you're not on the tour. That's just not right. And to be honest, I agree with the band on that. And they've offered Mick Mars initially 5%, going up to 7.5% of profits from this tour, which the band reckon is going to be in the region of about 100 to 120 million. So basically, they're offering Mars 5 to $10 million for payment on a tour that he's not even doing. And he's saying, oh, that's not right. I want 25%. So personally, I agree with the band on this. So if he's not on the tour, what's he getting 25% of? They haven't had a new album since apparently 2008. So there's no new music. They've said merch, but the band will just stop selling merch with Mick Mars on it. So I just can't see Mick Mars to be just trying to get money for nothing. That's my opinion. So that's where I stand on it. But I think the band... Like I said, they haven't made new music for like 15 years, which in itself is a joke. At least bands like Leopard make new music. So that's what's important to me, new music. But then we get into the point of CD sales, and that's a discussion for another day, because me personally, I think the industry is trying to destroy the CD. You don't get new CD players in cars. You don't get CD players in new computers. I really think they're trying to push people online onto Spotify. All new cars have Spotify in them, which I personally think is absolutely ridiculous. But again, that's a discussion for another day. Well, I mean, so many points here. Let's like say we're going to have to do more shows, you know, and get all these points discussed because, I mean, some great points raised by the pair of you. Um, Again, people, comment down below. Do you agree with Dave? Do you agree with Bruce? Have you got your own opinion on it? You know, let us know. This is supposed to be a discussion show, so let's get some debate going. That's the whole point of it. But there's been some lovely segues into the next part, which is a bit of a review section. And I know we've mentioned one of them already. Uh, and again, I'm going to flip over again to Dave, who's going to tell us about an album, actually, that's quite caught his fancy. Yeah, it's the new Def Leppard album with the um, the Royal Philharmonic Orchestra. Um, I didn't expect to like it. I've not particularly liked any of that sort of um, album that I've heard before. Uh, not that it's musically bad. You can't, you work with people like that. You're always going to get exemplary performances. I just, the, 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 the merger of traditional classical music with rock music is never sat comfortably with me. Um, the likes of um, Nightwish came along and found a way of incorporating um, sort of two elements in and have done it very well, and that's sort of um, mushroomed ever since. But when you get bands like um, Def Leppard coming along and saying, oh, we're going to play with um, uh, an orchestra, I'm thinking, hmm, that's just a sort of a bit of a sort of self-indulgent thing. Um, but um, to be fair, they're not the first that's done it. They won't be the last. Um, but it's something that you'd sort of listen to once and then sort of stick on the shelf and think, nah, would you go and listen to that or would you go and listen to Worm Hysteria or Pyromania? I know what my answer would have been. However, um, I've um, been listening to it on and off now for a couple of weeks and it really, really surprised me. Um, the choice of tracks is great. There are some obvious ones on there. There are some less obvious ones on there. Uh, I know that they released Animal first, uh, which was one actually that when you listen to it a couple of times, does lend itself to it um, uh, more readily than you thought it would have done. Mm. It's still recognisable as Animal, um, but the orchestra actually brings something different to it. They, they, they make it sound fuller. They make it sound uh, almost timeless. Uh, but when it's when you listen to things like Pour Some Sugar On Me, now the version that they've done of that is absolutely incredible. Uh, it is so completely different, so completely much more atmospheric, ethereal, otherworldly, whatever, whatever you, way you want to describe it. Uh, it just sounds, it sounds like Leopard, but credit to them for, for coming up with the idea, not just sitting back, taking the easy option. Uh, and what I like as well, 
is that they've not just sort of sat down with said right let somebody uh, do an orchestral arrangement of this we'll get them to do the backing track and then we'll put a few new vocals or whatever they've take, they've gone back to the original tracks so they've started with the original bass tracks they've deconstructed them they've put um orchestral pieces in you've even got instances where joe's singing with himself 30 years ago which actually sounds incredible uh so hats off to them uh what they've done is it is it, just a brilliant album um it's nothing like i was expecting it's nothing like um any other leopard album uh and i just think that they've come up with something they've put an angle on there and they've, they've just they've, they've brought something new which is always um, welcome in my book i mean I've, got be, I've heard the animal one because that's obviously the one that's publicly available and it grows on you uh, i must admit first time i heard it i wasn't impressed at all but i've sort of tried to stick with it because i'm a deaf leopard fan as well and you know it's yeah. one of those that I've had to struggle with, and I have struggled with, but I must admit, I'm now on the positive side of it. I mean, I can't wait to hear the ones that you, you mentioned, pour some sugar on me, and uh, some of the others as well. But it's a very strange... I mean, bringing you in, Bruce, I mean, what are your thoughts on sort of like mixing classical with rock the way that uh, Leopard and various other groups have done? To be honest, uh, well, I haven't heard the Leopard album, but the ones I have heard, I've really enjoyed. The one that really surprised me was when Uda Dirkschneider did it with an orchestra because I've been a big accept and Uda fan for years and uh, I just thought it worked wonderfully so I'm all for it it's something different and what we need these days sometimes is something different even if it's the older song is done differently I'm all for it I mean do you guys so go on Dave yeah I was going to say I, I would agree with that um, I forgot to mention it's actually called Drastic Symphonies uh, <laughs> But um, yeah, it's uh, it, it's out in a couple of months or so, and um, leopard fans um, might um, like to look towards uh, the next issue of Fireworks, um, because I won't say any more than that. But um, yeah, it, it's it, it is as Bruce said, it's something different. It brings something fresh. Um, it's not something that I can imagine that they would put um, an extensive all together to support because without doing it to backing vocals you're not just going to be able to um to to, to drag an orchestra um, around um, europe or north america because of the cost um, involved but i could actually see them doing a, f a few shows at somewhere like the albert hall um uh, with something like this uh and I'd, I'd definitely pay to go and see it yeah i'm sure there'll be a dvd out sometime soon as well i'm sure there will I mean, there you go. I mean, let us know again in the comments. Do you agree with this kind of thing? Do you agree with the mashup between classical and rock? Is it something that you guys would enjoy? Is it something that you think Def Leppard fans are going to enjoy? I mean, let us know. We're, we are keen to get everyone's opinions on these things. Um, yeah. Bruce, how are you? Are you able to tell us anything new about uh, Circle of Friends 2 or any other things that you've got going on? Yeah, well, I haven't been listening to much new music recently because I've been basically too busy working on Circle of Friends 2 with Khalil Turk. Uh, I was never going to do it, but he convinced me and I got some extra money came my way, which made it more viable. So I thought, yeah, I want to do this. And my whole idea with Circle of Friends was always to have several covers and originals. And these are covers that have been in my mind I've wanted to do for years. So like on Circle of Friends 2, there's four cover versions. Um, Daxon, Princess of the Night, is a song I've always wanted to do because I've loved the original, but if you listen back to it in the mix, it's not that great. So I've always wanted to do that one more powerful, and then we added Hammond keyboards onto it as well, and we've got Jeff Scott Soto singing that, and I just think it sounds amazing. The other one we've got is Europe, Girl from Lebanon, where I've got uh, Tanya Rizkala singing on it. So that's a girl from Lebanon singing... A Girl from Lebanon, which I've always been a Europe fan as well, but I just that was just too cool not to do. The other, the other one I've got might surprise people is 10, The Robe. Yeah. Because 10's third album, The Robe, is one of my favourite 10 albums, as regards song. But the mix is just awful. I've always wanted to redo that album or remix it. And um, I don't have the master, so I couldn't do that. So when we were discussing with Khalil's songs for Circle of Friends 2, we thought, Hmm. Huh. why don't we do a song off Ten the Robe? And we chose to do the, the title track. And to be honest, it sounds amazing. So I'm really happy with that. And for the AOR fans, 
a song I've loved for years, Van Zant, Midnight Sensation. I'm going to have Robin McCauley doing that, and that'll keep the AR fans happy and me happy. So that's four covers, and it's going to have eight originals, and uh, it'll be coming out probably back end of summer. So I'm really looking forward to to getting that done. Brilliant. And obviously, we're going to, I'm sure we're all going to look forward to hearing it as well, because if it's as good as the first one, fans, you're in for a treat is all I can say. Um, Thank you. Unfortunately, we are running out of our time segment, so I'm going to have to wrap this up. So, you know, we've had, like I say, we've had plenty of views here on plenty of subjects. Uh, let us know. Let us know what you think. You know, we're going to come back and do this uh, if it proves popular. We've got plenty of stuff to discuss. I mean, Dave's brought up plenty of things already in his uh, segments to discuss and uh, some very good things as well. So from me, Pete Anna, it's a goodbye. I shall let both Bruce and Dave say goodbye as well. If okay, guys, to... thanks for everything. It's been it's actually been a fun time. I was a bit nervous about how this would go, but I've actually enjoyed it. Brilliant. Yeah, thanks, guys. Um, uh, goodbye to everybody. Keep rocking. And like Bruce said, um, it's been new to me as well, but um, I've quite enjoyed it too. Excellent. And more importantly, if you want to go and check out Fireworks Magazine, the www.fireworksmagazine.com, as Dave says, it's available online to buy. It's available in hard copy in WH Smiths and other news agents as well. So go and check us out. It is new. It is different. It has certainly grown, as Bruce alluded to at the beginning part of it, you know, from what it started out to what it is now. And we're aiming to get it even better. So go and check it out. If you're a great lover of rock and metal music and progressive uh, blues, rock, metal, Check us out. Why not? What have you got to lose? The price of a magazine. It's not an awful lot. So go and see us. Until next time, everybody, take care. <laughs>